Welcome to Excel Radio with Dr. Nick Zarowski, where we talk with world-class entrepreneurs, executives, and health experts who have unlocked the secrets to Excel Health and performance. Hi, everyone. I'm your host, Dr. Nick Zarowski, and I am here with a very special guest today. His name is Jason, and he is the founder of Mastermind Talks. And um, he, uh, he also has a podcast, uh, MMT. And so welcome to the show, Jason. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, definitely my pleasure. So, you know, Jason, like most entrepreneurs, you know, you have a story of, you know, highs and lows and in, in it, in it correlates with your health as long yeah. as well as with your business. Am I correct? Sure. So, you know, I, for me, I think that your, your business is very much attached to your health. And, and so hearing, you know, your story is very interesting. And so if you could just go ahead and tell us your story and, uh, and, and share that with you, with us, that would be incredible. Sure. Well, I'll first preface this preface this by saying I'm getting over a cold, so I could have used your services a few weeks back to yeah. avoid this cold. You didn't but, call. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, really quickly, and in my my, I guess my entrepreneurial journey does really tie into the importance of health, um, and how that came to be is uh, I used to. So I dropped out of high school, started a service based business, realized that service based businesses are hard to scale, and I pivoted to an online product business, which we grew to about six million dollars a year over four years of no outside investments. I was living my whole model of success. I was living a whole four-hour work week where I was traveling the world. I was making all this money. Um, but with all that money and all that free time, I started asking myself questions like, well, why am I here? Will I be remembered? How many people show up to my funeral? And if I was being honest with myself, I wasn't happy with the answers I was giving myself. And right. around that time, I also realized I was making 22 times the national average income. Um, and in most business circles, that would be celebrated. But right. for yeah. me... Uh, I knew I was not 22 times happier than the average male. I was not 22 times healthier. When I was 23, uh, I had kidney complications because of stress. I actually got admitted to hospital because of stress wow. of my business. I actually uh, had kidney issues. So I realized that money and happiness scale very differently. Right, right. So, so how, how you measure success then, right? Sure, yeah. yeah. And I mean, the, or the importance in health kind of, I mean, right after that, I basically consciously decided to sell my business to get out of it. Uh, subconsciously, I started to kind of detach myself from it because I saw it as a source of pain. Um, over time, became comfortable with the idea of scaling it down to zero. Two things happened that were on my control that landed me a quarter million dollars of cash debt, which was August of 2012. Wow. And that was my quote unquote rock bottom. Um, wow. And like most entrepreneurs, I built my business at the expense of my health. I was just focused on my business. Everything was about my business. I was eating really well at the time, <laughs> not in a healthy way, uh, but uh, I was I was eating pretty good at the time. And I was 72 pounds heavier than I am now. Okay. And um, the scariest part of it all, everybody hears a quarter million dollars, they're like, oh my God, that's a lot of money. And and yeah. I mean, it's all in context. When you make $6 million a year, whatever, a quarter million isn't like the end of the world. But with all the added pressure because of the debt and the creditors, and I was out, I had no business anymore. Yeah. Um, with all this added pressure and all this uncertainty, uh, I had no energy, right? I mean, right. it's like I had a Ferrari for a brain with no gas in the tank. And that was by far the most scariest aspect because I knew that I had the mental capacity to pull myself out. I knew I right. could make the money again, but I had no energy. I couldn't get out of bed. Right. And I mean, I, the whole, you know, can't get out of bed. I could get out of bed, but there was no point. I mean, my, my head was all kind of just, it was just cloudy and I had no energy. And my daughter was six months old at the time and I just got married. So there was other stuff compounding on top of that, that I was trying to, there was just so much transition going on. Yeah. But that's when I really realized the importance of focusing on your health um, and kind of keeping that in check. And I've always gone up and down in weight and health and that kind of stuff. I lost uh, exactly odd, <laughs> oddly enough. Um, when I was in high school, I was, I was a fat kid and I was 252 pounds. And uh, I grew up, my girlfriend and I have like four years broke up and I decide to, you know, no, there's no better time to get in shape than when you're back on the market. Yeah, exactly. Your best foot forward. So I lost all the way. I went from 252 to 168 in one year. And I did it doing it the complete wrong way. I barely ate. And I would literally, I'd run like a gazelle. I'd go to the gym six, seven days a week. I'd run like a gazelle on the treadmill for an hour. And then I'd go do weights. And I couldn't figure out why on my second set, I feel like I'm going to pass out. Mm -hmm. So uh, I've always been on this kind of up and down roller coaster. And when I you know, was kind of down and out financially and in my business, 
I knew that before I started trying to climb out financially, I need to get my health back in check. Right. Um, so with sleep and, and that kind of stuff. And now, you know, still up and down, but I mean, I'm, I'm at a healthy weight. My energy is fantastic. Um, and, and I'm just, I'm, I eat really, really clean. Yeah. Uh, that, well, that's, that's interesting. So you had the money, you, you had the success, but you didn't have happiness. You didn't have your health mentally. You didn't have your health uh, physically. Sure. And, and so that's, you know, that was a struggle then, you know? Huge. Yeah. I mean, it, there's, I mean, Tony Robbins has, has, a, has a story that he shares that we was like, he went to a Silk Soleil show or something like that. And he was, he was sitting there and uh, there was like three seats next to him. And this guy came in and huge guy, like 400 pounds or something and sat down and somebody went to Tony. He's like, do you know who the guy is? And Tony's like, no, he's like, he's like the richest man in Canada. Or one of the richest men in Canada. And he's like, no, he's not. You know what I mean? Like yeah. given like you, when you have that kind of <laughs> issue or handicap to some degree, you have to be very clear what success is to you. And um, a lot of people get on this, 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 I call the entrepreneur a hamster wheel where they build a business they hate or they pursue a career they hate to enable them to buy things they don't need to impress people that they don't even like. And they do this at the expense of the relationship with their family, their spouse, their health. Oftentimes the health is the easiest thing to put on a back burner. Yeah. Uh, and it really bites you when you, you don't focus on it. Oh yeah. You know, there's so, I mean, I focus on working with a lot of entrepreneurs and executives and that's definitely one of those things where it's incredible to me to even, even, you know, some of the people that you can, you can show to them, you know, lab data of, look, your health is in trouble right now. You've got mm -hmm. some serious problems, how they can look at it and blow it off as if it's nothing, you know, it, that's, that's unbelievable to me. Yeah, it's, it's, it's sad. And I, I try my best to, you know, share my story and my kind of, um, Thing. And I, I, I find myself, it's always these cycles as well. You, you, you start getting focused on business and then you realize, you know, your health is slipping. And it, the, th the thing is, I mean, a, a scale is not the best, best measure of how healthy you are. No. You know what I mean? Like it, it's, it's, really, it's really not. So you, you don't realize, like I got a, a proper, like a, I don't know what kind of test it was. It was like a saliva test. Mm -hmm. And I found out like my, my testosterone was like half of the average male. And the average male nowadays has low testosterone to begin with. Right. And yeah, I've noticed this everywhere. issue amongst a lot of entrepreneurs and you know obviously uh adrenals and low adre like yeah. adrenals are drained and all this kind of stuff I and mean, you got to take care of that stuff and uh, even though like i said i've learned the hard way i still every once in a while have to kind of remind myself or i get these kind of rude awakenings that i'm like I, I you know if i can't shake a cold or i get a cold in the first place i'm like this is ridiculous why am i getting a cold and then i can't shake it and i'm like well there's something here so yeah. Well, I mean, I think as an entrepreneur, you just you you get really wrapped up in projects, and you just you know hone in on a project with like laser like focus, and and next thing you know, you're forgetting about something else, you know, and, and that's why it's like you need a you almost need something on a daily basis to have those checks and balances, so that you're reminded of these different things. You're reminded of hey, I'm not spending enough time with my family, I'm not spending enough time on my health, whatever the case is, you know. Yeah, there's a great quote. I, I, I shoot. I wish I had it. Um, I had it at the bottom of my email for the longest time. I got to pull it up because it's it's a quote from Nikola Tesla, um, okay. and it, and it basically sums up like what the entrepreneur. Goes. So it's uh, Nikola Tesla once said, uh, "I do not think there is any thrill that can go through the human heart like that is felt by an inventor or an entrepreneur in this case." As he, as he sees some creation of the brain unfolding to success, such emotion makes a man forget food, sleep, friends, love, and everything. And I think that's just what we get caught up in. We just yeah. get tunnel vision and then mm -hmm. everything goes to, you know, sideways to some degree. Yeah, so. yeah, absolutely, without a doubt. So then you basically, you, you were having these times where your health and all this was at its lowest. And, yep. you know, you talked how you have had problems over time where you're up and down, up and down with your health or your weight. What is it that really started setting you straight? There had to have been something like an on switch somewhere that just got you on the straight and narrow. Uh, it was, I, I think that that moment where like literally I felt like I had the mental capacity to pull myself out, but I had no energy and I'm like, where do you start from here? Like I, right. it was terrifying it was by far more terrifying than anything else um and then that's, that's when i kind of it really switched for me and again you get busy and you you kind of lose focus every once in a while and i I'm, I'm pretty good at bringing myself back on track um and uh i mean i have also pretty kind of lofty fitness goals to some degree I'm, I'm good at like setting stuff far out 
to uh i because i don't like the word like i don't even like like the terminology of like working out i like training for something right. I, did, I did martial arts for many years just using the word training means like you're actually pursuing something or going after yeah. something and as an entrepreneur we're you know we're achievers right if you set a goal i'm, I'm gonna get it you know what yeah. i mean it's, just, it's like a, it's like a dog and a bone or something yeah. right so I know that's how my mind works. Mm -hmm. So I can't just like work out for the hell of working out. Right. I need something to work towards. Um, okay. And uh, so that's why every, usually once a year um, I do something. So last year was like a Tough Mudder, which wasn't that big of a deal. This year I'm doing something called Seal Fit um, 20X in, in Encinitas which scares the crap out of me. Yeah, see, uh, I'm not familiar with it, but it sounds good. <laughs> yeah, so it's basically uh, a friend of mine did the legit. So basically it's this guy named... Um, Mark Devine, and he's a former Navy SEAL, graduated top of his class, was Navy SEAL for like 15, 20 years or something. Um, he has this program called SEAL Fit, where it's a CrossFit type academy, but it's a mixture of CrossFit meditation and yoga. Okay. Um, so it's kind of like the whole warrior, he, what he believes is like the whole warrior combo, I guess, to some degree. And he does these, these programs where he has this thing called Kokoro Camp, which is a 50 hour Navy SEAL hell week condensed into 50 hours in essence. So literally, you know, spraying you with water, yelling at you, making you do a thousand burpees, going out to the ocean, like all that kind of stuff. Um, and I'm doing the child version of that, which is 14 hours straight of okay. just that kind of stuff. And, uh, so that's what I'm training for the end of November. Uh, so that and I have a 160 kilometer race I'm doing over six stages in August. So again, if I didn't have those things, yeah. I would not be as driven to be into the gym oh, yeah. as much as I can and eating as clean as I do. Yeah, because I think that, you know, setting up those events, you know, you have no choice but to show up for them at this point. You know, you paid for them. You're not going to just skip out on them. And I make sure I make it public too. I mean, there's, there's, yeah. there's, there's, the, there's a thing, uh, Derek Sivers has this famous Ted talk. You should never share your goals and that kind of stuff because of this like false completion, which basically like if you share your goal unconsciously, you feel like you already achieved it. Mm -hmm. And for me, peer pressure and the integrity of my word by saying I'm going to do something is far more of a motivator gotcha. than, than anything else. So if I say publicly, you know, I'm doing a mastermind talks event. It's I'm, there's no canceling. I'm doing it right, just out of yeah. integrity. If I'm doing this 160 kilometer race, I got to do it. Like basically, the minute I put it out to my network, it's happening. It's it's so <laughs> I I know there's no out uh, because people will ask me about it and that kind of stuff. So yeah. Um, that's yeah, that's in my calendar. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. So, is there anything that you do on a daily basis that sets you up for success on a daily basis? Uh, so I've done many different things. Um, you know, I'm always testing um, okay. what works best for me. I mean, I think that's the, the one thing with like weight loss or getting healthy. There's no silver bullet because everybody has different schedules and different needs and different mm -hmm. demands and that kind of stuff. And that's one thing I've learned is that what works for one person won't necessarily work for me. So I try a bunch of different things and, and okay. kind of test it on myself and, and see how it goes. So I've done stuff like early morning rituals, like waking up at 4 a.m. Um, and having okay. a very strict morning. I did that for 18 months. Okay. Uh, cold showers. Ice baths. I've done that for. I did. I stopped recently because it's 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 cold. It's freezing in Toronto right now. So it, makes, yeah. <laughs> it just it just adds on top of that. Yeah, um, I'm in Michigan and it's the same thing. I, <laughs> I I still try to utilize it a little bit, but it's more about like just like slowly turning the the water a little colder in the shower versus just yeah. jumping into an ice bath because yeah, it's. I mean, it's like. 10 degrees here right now sure yeah i gotta get back into it. i gotta pony up and get back into yeah. it you know there's a saying you know uh, do what is difficult when it when it's easy yeah and uh that's like the whole you know even navy seal training i mean they the, they train so hard and so brutal so that by the time they go to war it's it's a piece it's a walk in the park you know what i mean mm -hmm. so that's how i gotta start kind of treating things so i gotta get back to ice showers and or sorry uh, ice baths um which i i did for quite some time uh really the biggest thing now is uh um, again, so I tested that extreme, waking up extremely early and having yeah. very structured mornings, um, which is kind of a lot of people are getting onto now. Yeah. Now I'm going the opposite way where I don't use an alarm clock. Um, I wake up whatever my body needs because I obviously understand the importance of sleep. Right. Um, and I'm working a lot on strength training uh, right now. So I, the body needs to recover through sleep. So uh, now I don't wake up with an alarm clock. I've been doing that for about three, four months. Okay. Uh, which is which is great, and then uh, do you eating. find do you find yourself still waking up like fairly early though? Yep, still wake up okay. uh, this morning. I woke up at five thirty. Okay, That's so I'm in bed 
uh, when I was waking up at 4 a.m., I was in bed at like 8.30 at night, 8 o'clock at night. Yeah. Now I'm usually sleeping by 9.30, 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock usually latest. Um, but even if I go to bed at midnight, um, which last night I actually I actually did, uh, which is rare, um, I still wake up at 6 a.m., 5.30 a.m. Yeah. Because that's just my, I guess, my yeah. circadian rhythm or something. Yeah, well, uh, that's the same for me. That's why I, I hate getting to bed late because I know <laughs> darn well that uh, I'm up first thing in the morning regardless of how late I go to bed. Exactly. It's, it's true, yeah. No, and it's funny because I – even when I had an alarm, I'm not waking up that much later than when I had the alarm going, right? And the alarm just right. kind of startles you when you're kind of like in deep yeah. sleep or whatever. And your body needs what your body needs. Um, so I've gone to that extreme now where I'm – sleep, you know, is the biggest thing for me right now. Um, and strength training and eating clean, um, it's, it's, it's pretty much it. I mean I know like I'm gluten-free. Uh, every once in a while I'll, I'll kind of slip a bit. Um, but for the most part, definitely gluten free, um, a lot of vegetables, uh, that kind of stuff. Because yeah. I, I mean, if you once you eat, it's like the whole boiling the frog thing, right? Once you start eating clean and you feel healthy, you have something yeah. like you know pizza or something like that. You realize how much it just sucks you down. Yeah. Right. And the whole boiling the frog theory is if you want to boil a frog, frog, and you throw him in boiling water, he'll jump right out. If you throw him in lukewarm water and then turn up the heat, you'll boil him. And the most People in North America, I mean, they don't realize how unhealthy they are until they really taste health for the first time. Right. And one of the things that's important that you had mentioned, too, <laughs> is that you are training right now. So, yeah. you know, that's one thing that keeps people in check is if you're training for something, then you you get off that diet or you go crush a pizza the night before and you have to get up and run in the morning or lift weights. Like yeah. it, it's so miserable for you that you aren't going to do it again. Like it's it's going to be a learning experience. Sure. I mean, there's there's one thing to note as well. Like, you don't even have to be training for something physical. I treated the last two Mastermind Talks events. So I'm in the event space. I hold one event a year. I treat those as like an athlete would treat a marathon. Like, I try to peak from a health perspective up to the event because I know my adrenals are going to get hammered for the like two weeks leading up to the event, especially the two days of the event. I need to be like on the best that I can. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the one thing is I, I even treat, even though that's a business context, I understand the importance of being on and having energy and, and vitality and that kind of stuff. Uh, I treat even business events as, as kind of, you know, I guess, training uh, reasons to some degree. Oh, definitely. And you definitely should, you know, make sure you get your mind right. You're going to, when those come, come up, it's inevitable that you're going to experience an uh, incredible amount of stress at some right. points. And uh, yeah. yeah, you got to. You got to be like an athlete coming out of the gate. You got to be ready for it. Yeah, 100%. Um, the other thing I think that's important that you had mentioned is, you know, you said I'm gluten free, but, you know, I, here and there I uh, have a few things. And, and it's important, too, for people to not create such strict rules for themselves that they're setting themselves up for failure because so many people do that. And uh, it, it's really interesting. I mean, because I have people tell me all the time, well, I didn't do good at this or, or, or I could have done better. And it's like, hey, look, we're all human and, and this is real world. So this type of thing happens. You know, don't sure. beat yourself up so much. Just do the best you can. Yeah, it's funny because uh, Dave Asprey uh, interviewed uh, Mark Devine on his podcast. And Dave Asprey is like strict, you know, this is the way you eat and don't eat outside. And Dave's a friend. So yeah. Uh, I'm not taking a stab at him or anything. I mean, what he does is, is fantastic. But he asked uh, Mark Devine, who's that Navy SEAL, um, who you think has like the most incredible discipline, the most yeah. incredible willpower possible, incredible shape the guy is in. And he asked him, he's like, what do you, like how strict are you with your diet? And he's like, I'm 80, 20. He's like 80% of the time I'm good, 20% I eat whatever I want. And I'm like, if that's good enough for a Navy SEAL, yeah. that is good enough for me. Uh, that's and that's kind of how, I mean, I think just being aware, self-aware enough to know that, hey, I'm moving down a slippery slope. That's mm -hmm. the biggest thing for me is when I do slip up, it's, yeah. uh, so if I do have something, it's, I'm much more prone to have that same thing the following day. Like it's easy to get into a slump. Uh, and I think that self-awareness of seeing yourself getting into a slump and being able to kind of correct yourself. Mm -hmm. Cause I know if I, I, if I start slipping bad enough and it happens, uh, then I'll fast for like two days, yeah. um, two or three days. And then it, it's so funny because I have these these voices in my head. Like the end of day one, I'm like, all right, okay, I won't eat anything but just let me have some broccoli or something because yeah. I'm starving, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I think, yeah, I think that awareness kind of uh, plays into it. But I think that balance is everything. I'd rather live, you know, 85 years dabbling with like, you know, enjoying life right. than living 95 years on a, you know, 
like a monk to some degree, right. you know what I mean? Yeah, with, exactly. with a lot of structure, right? I mean, with, uh, my I, I, my wife would not stay with me if I ate clean 100%. She likes the idea of like a Ben Greenfield and a triathlete body and that yeah. kind of stuff. She would not. <laughs> she <laughs> would so, not live with that. It's a different story to actually follow it then, huh? 100%. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, the lifestyle yeah. that comes with that uh, kind of strict regimen and stuff like that is not fun. Yeah, no, exactly. But uh, you, you had mentioned how you would fast and, you know, that's a great way for you to like, I mean, I call it a reset button. You know, there's yeah. there, it has an incredible amount of healing properties um, when you're doing a fast for your gut and your body to detox and, and clean up and you burn an incredible amount of fat. But um, the other thing it's great for is if you're finding yourself where you just can't get off the sweets or something, just fast. That's the that's a reset button that you come back on or once you start eating food again. Yeah. I mean, you eat something like a cucumber and it's like the the tastiest thing you've ever had, you know. Yeah, you I mean, you yeah, that it it it, it, it resets like everything. Your mindset, it resets your like your appetite. You realize how li- like you said, how little food you need mm-hmm. to to be like, you know, on top of the world to some degree because I think the saying you probably know it the number better than I do, but I think it's like 40% of your energy goes towards digestion. To oh, yeah. degree, right? So you think about like all the crap you eat and if oh, you yeah. eat cleaner, I mean, that's a lot of your energy you're conserving for things that matter, like dealing with the stresses of your life and business and relationships and, and that kind of stuff. But, but fasting is something, um, uh, is something that's been pretty, I've been doing intermittent fasting for the past three years, two, three years. Yeah. Um, so that means no breakfast. First meal is at, at noon. Um, which has been great, and like I said, um, I I I do a full fast um, when I feel like I'm really slipping because I like I said I hate I hate not eating, and it's almost like a punishment for me. Like you're you know you're gonna <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're exactly. gonna learn type thing. So yeah yeah. And, and, and you know the fasting the thing is too is uh, you, you can easily do a fast and I mean unless you have serious health problems it's, you can do a fast and but the thing is along the way is your mind plays games with you you know you were saying how you just want to eat something the whole time I think it's really interesting because when you're doing this fast your um, your uh, brain first of all you're constantly thinking of food but mm-hmm. also the time that you spend eating meals throughout the day is really interesting because all of a sudden you have all this extra time through your day you're like why do I have so much time Hundred percent, because and then, and just knowing, like, making a deal with yourself that you're not going to have breakfast, it, it clears up your mind of like, what am I going to eat, and yeah. you know, do I have time oh, to yeah. do dishes and that kind of stuff. Like, I I had all I had for lunch today was I was trying to have chicken and broccoli and vegetables. I didn't have time to make the chicken, so I just had vegetables yeah. or whatever. But yeah, from a time commitment perspective, oh, yeah. uh, just skipping breakfast. And it, I mean, the, the the studies show it, the like the health benefits of intermittent fasting. Um, yeah. From uh, yeah, clarity perspective, a health perspective, a time management perspective, you name it. I mean, I've seen no downsides, and I've it's something I I apply pretty rigorously. Yeah. How many hours do you uh, fast at night during intermittent fasting? Uh, so I mean, I I I know some people like track their windows, their feeding windows, yeah. and stuff like that. I I'm definitely not that strict. Uh, I vary with it personally. Sure, but I mean, usually um, my last meal is seven p.m. Okay, and my uh, my meal the following day is at noon, and that's like clockwork. So whatever that window is, um, which I think is around the eight hour window, so sixteen hour a uh, fasting period. Yeah, yeah, and, and for everybody listening here, the. <laughs> intermittent fasting you're supposed to consume the same amount of calories yeah. that you do on a normal day it's just you do it within a short window of time versus you know the typical grazing that people are doing nowadays because it's you know it's detrimental to your health yeah i mean i love i mean that, i know the whole old conventional wisdom was like six to eight meals a day on yeah, yeah. and from a productivity perspective that's a disaster i much <laughs> rather have like two big meals yeah um because i just i Channel, I, I generally like eat a lot to some degree, mm-hmm. and then just even naturally like removing one meal, it it cuts back your calories just kind of naturally or your intake to, to some degree. And again, you know, we talked about eating too much to begin with um, mm-hmm. to be sustainable. So yeah, that's interesting. So with your rituals in the morning that you were, <laughs> that you brought up, are you do you have like a certain method to to how you're doing them, or is it just wake up in the morning and you and you just start working? How how do you go about your rituals? Uh, so always changing depending on what's a priority. Uh, I mean, the, so the general rule of thumb, just from a productivity perspective, like I said, sleep to whenever I need, which is historically, I wake up around six, five thirty six. Yeah. 
now I'm starting to go to gym daily. This is something I'm implementing now, yeah. uh, going to gym daily and not going crazy hard or whatever. But just, I've just always learned or I've always realized in my own body, even just hopping. I mean, I'm sitting on a treadmill desk right now. I'm not walking right now, but I have a treadmill desk. That's cool. But uh, going, just going to the gym and being able to like listen to a podcast and kind of just decompress before the kind of the day starts. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a, it's just a nice way to to kickstart, and it's one of those uh, almost like keystone habits that mm-hmm. you know if you start the day doing something that's physical, it makes you know healthy uh, eating habits throughout like choices throughout the day significantly easier. Uh, so that's one thing I'm implementing right now. As far as my days are concerned, um, I usually. I have one thing that I'm supposed to do daily. Um, so I set this out a, f- a month in advance. I ask myself, what does I want? Well, like, what do I want the end of February to look like? Like, what did I achieve in my business? And the results I want to achieve. Then I work my way back in order to achieve that. What do I have to accomplish day by day? Only one thing. And that one thing, uh, I do it first thing in the morning because that's uh, the studies have shown decision fatigue. So you have less willpower throughout the uh, Sorry. Willpower fatigue, so you have less willpower throughout the day. You have most willpower first thing in the morning. Mm-hmm. So whenever I want to build a new habit, like right now is going to the gym six, seven days a week, um, I do it first thing in the morning because that's the most amount of willpower I have. And also I'm not reacting to stimulus at 5.30 in the morning. I'm not getting new emails. I'm not getting new Facebook notifications. Mm-hmm. And oftentimes as, as just you know living in this 21st century, um, yeah. You roll out of bed, first thing you grab is your cell phone. Mm-hmm. And from that point forward, you're not in control of your day. And when you're not in control, you, I mean, there's one, perceived control is one of the pillars of happiness. Mm-hmm. And when you're not in control, you're just, you can't be happy. So yeah. I try to avoid reacting to other people's agenda through email or reacting to stimulus like Facebook notifications, all that kind of stuff, till I you know, did what's important, like it's going to the gym, that kind of stuff, and doing that one major task. Then after that, I may reward myself by, you know, fiddling around on Facebook or something like that. But that's the biggest thing. And like I said, I used to have very structured morning rituals. And there's a friend of mine, Hal Elrod, has a book called The Miracle Morning. It has like affirmations and meditation and workout. Yeah. And like, and I just, I did that and I'm, I'm, I'm starting to realize the, the power and simplicity and just focusing on the things that, the 80-20, the things that really matter, that 20% that give 80% of the difference. Right. You know, I've kind of went through that type of thing myself. And I mean, I currently have pretty decent morning rituals to where I'm getting up at a certain time and I'm (laughs) focusing on uh, basically whatever is my most important project or maybe it's something I don't really want to do, that type of project. Yeah, yeah, 100%. And uh, so, I mean, that's that's where I'm at with that right now. But um, I I definitely think that starting off that you probably – it probably helps to have pretty strict dif- discipline. And then after you can create that discipline um, by following a strict schedule, then you could probably you know, get a little more lackadaisical with it like you are saying that you are right now. Yeah, I mean, and the, I mean, the one thing to you know to touch on discipline, like I, my morning ritual started with one thing, which was waking up early. Um, yeah. And just tough. Like, that could be tough. Sure. Yeah. Um, but it's one of those things. Once you start seeing the results and how you feel and stuff like that, then it's it becomes almost addictive, right? And just like any habit, the the philosophy around habit building is is tiny habits, right? I mean, if you want to start flossing your teeth, floss one tooth every night. And eventually you'll start flossing all your teeth, right? You'll just, you'll have the habit uh, ingrained to some degree. So um, that's the biggest thing when doing any kind of major change, whether it be going to the gym. Um, I'll give you a great example. When I lost all my weight the second time, so when I ended up quarter million dollars in debt, 72 pounds overweight, uh, I was smarter than I was the first time. I was not going to like kill myself in the gym and barely eat anything. Mm -hmm. I said, you know, this is basically a, a whole new set of habits, healthy habits that I need to implement. So I knew how habits were worked to some degree. So the first month I went to the gym, the goal was to go to the gym three times a week and spend no longer than 10 minutes. No schedule whatsoever, mm-hmm. uh, no workout plan, or anything. just go the act of going to the gym. And it mm-hmm. killed me because as an achiever, you want to like lose the weight yesterday. You know what yeah, I mean? So oh, you yeah. want to kill yourself, but then that's not sustainable. Mm-hmm. You don't build the habit. So the first month was all about going to the gym, not pushing myself anything longer than 10 minutes, as ridiculous as it sounds. But then the second month was extending that to half an hour. Mm-hmm. And then uh, the third month was actually implementing uh, some kind of workout routine. 
uh, and picking up intensity. The fourth month was changing my eating habits. Mm -hmm. And then within probably about, that took a little longer the second time around because I was doing it health on a healthy, well, I guess, way. Yeah. Um, that took about 14 months to lose that weight. Um, but I felt great through the entire process and it just, I had healthy habits. Yeah, no, that's that's great. One of the things that I'll do sometimes just so that I go to the gym and work hard, it's like, hey, I got I got a half hour here, no more, you know. Yeah. Get there, get in, get it done. Don't talk to anybody. You know, stay focused. And, and then I mean, all of a sudden, you're like, how, all right, where's where's the next weight? Where's I got I got to get on this treadmill. I got to speed it up a little bit. I got to work harder. And that's really how you of, should work out. The hardest part of the gym is just showing up. Is getting there. Once you're there, I mean, that's eighty percent of the work has been done. And I'm so even myself, I have to keep on telling myself like today. I'm again, I'm getting into that routine of, of really picking up. Uh, going to the gym mm -hmm. and today I did a, a workout it was about 40 minutes and then I was gonna I told myself you gotta hop on the uh, treadmill and do 30 minutes of cardio that has to be part of it and I'm like I had to stop myself and say hey listen you, you know commit to 40 minutes oh. and then you come back tomorrow and tomorrow you do cardio and the day after maybe you do weights again or whatever but don't because if I, if, it, if it's an hour and a half commitment or a two hour commitment when stuff gets busy in my life then I'll have an excuse to be like that's gonna take two and a half hours of my day yes. I can't do that today which means I won't be able to do that tomorrow which means I won't be able to do that Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then yeah. it's a slippery slope. So 100% correct. Yeah, no, that's that's really interesting. Um, when it comes to your business, could you speak <clears throat> a little bit on that? Because a lot of our listeners are entrepreneurs, and uh, you 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 had a business. You had said that it had uh, you basically closed it down because it was yep. you know ruining your life, and then you have started another business. And explain that a little bit. Yeah, so I, mean, I was just simply unhappy in my first business. Uh, like most entrepreneurs, I picked my business based on opportunity and proximity. Um, you know, we're often taught to, you know, whatever is the most profitable business we can get into, uh, that's what you go after. Uh, but I was selling, I was selling concert tickets and sporting event tickets. I was reselling tickets. Um, I don't go to concerts. I see no value in going to concerts. I've never been to a sporting event, like really. <laughs> Um, and we sell, like, for example, Toronto Maple Leafs are huge in Toronto. Mm -hmm. We sold billions of dollars of tickets a year. I never went to a game. I never saw value in it. And it's hard to get behind something oh, you yeah. don't see value in, right? So, um, so you're probably I, dragging yourself to work every day, basically, right? Oh, I mean, the company died with, like, because I wasn't there. I'd, I'd show up maybe once a month uh, oh. <laughs> towards the end. And uh, wow. when an entrepreneur gets dis disengaged like that, I mean, you talk about the culture in your business. Um, you know, when an entrepreneur gets the culture was so bad, I didn't even want to go to work and it was my own business. Right. So the, the I kind of created my own cancer within the business and disconnected myself. And by then the employees were were uh, they were disconnected as well. I mean, if, if the leader doesn't want to be there, what do you think the employees are going to be like? You know, oh, I have job security. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, exactly. Um, so they were worried and they just killed the business even faster. Mm -hmm. So I had this, those ripple effects. Um, and then I got into to mastermind talks and, and mastermind talks, man, I mean, it lights me up on every level. I mean, financially, I'm not where I need to be yet, but I've never felt wealthier. And I've also realized in this process how much energy comes from happiness and purpose oh, and yeah. stuff like that. Like mm -hmm. uh, I was focused originally on like getting my health back on track and, uh, you know, through clean eating and stuff like that. But man, when you get like – when you just deliver value to somebody and they send you a thank yeah. you note or something like that, I mean, that boosts your energy like nothing else. So I've never felt more energy. Mm -hmm. Part of it is because of the, the, the health stuff, the health yeah. changes I made, like clean eating and stuff like that. Part of it is because what I do, I love immensely. I care yeah. immensely about the people that, that I do work. Like I, I don't refer to people as customers. I never use the word customer. I don't even know how to refer to them because yeah. they're literally all close friends and some of these people, I take a bullet for them. And that's- yeah completely different from my last business where uh i mean i just didn't like my customers <laughs> whatsoever <laughs> so it's i mean i'm in a beautiful place yeah. so well that's yeah. really awesome and uh yeah i mean so with your other business you know why didn't you consider selling it uh, a couple of reasons so one um it was difficult because i was kind of the core of the business and i know okay. a lot of entrepreneurs get in this loop where they're like oh nobody can do what i can do and that kind of yeah. stuff Given the, just the, the model of the business, I really was the the linchpin, um, okay. and I had nobody in within the company that could take on a leadership role or grow into my position. Um, I would have to find somebody 
uh, if I could find somebody, and I was never good at, at identifying like a talent. And that's not even that's not even an appealing proposition to like find somebody to replace you and be like, listen, dude, I hate the business, but I want you to come work and take my position. You know what I mean? So, yes. <laughs> um, so th- that was c- one, one main factor. Uh, another main factor, psychologically, I saw the business as a source of pain. I had people who wanted to buy the business from me. Yeah, <laughs> and um, you they just were, didn't, like, you just didn't want it around. No, the, well, yeah, part of, I've heard other entrepreneurs say this as well. Like they literally, I, I literally wanted to see the business die. Um, cause so I felt very like, attached hundred <clears throat> percent. Yeah. And I also saw it as a source of pain because I pursued what I thought was success, which was making money and I made a lot of it. And then I'm like, I'm unhappy. And, and when people approach me to buy the business, I didn't tell them this, but, uh, unconsciously i'm like i don't want to sell the business to them and then them coming back to me two years later saying you ruined my life you know what i mean as crazy as it sounds yeah. oh yeah um <clears throat> so i had to i had to kind of get out and scale uh, scale it down so being the linchpin not being able to identify a talent mm-hmm. seeing the business as a source of pain there's other kind of layers of self-sabotage and stuff like that that go into it um but uh yeah well now that you love what you do you have a ton of energy and and i think that uh everybody sees that in their life to a certain point. It's like try to get out of bed on a day that you don't want to do something that you have to do or, or try to get out of bed on a day that is, uh, or, you know, jump out of bed on a day that you're doing something like going on you know, a vacation you've always wanted to go on. Like you can't even sleep that night. You have so much energy, you know? Sure. So it's a big difference. Well, it's like Warren Buffett had one of his books was uh, titled, uh, tap dancing to work. Um, and that's like, I mean, that's every, that's how I feel. You know what I mean? I I literally love what I do and I, I love the people and it's, it's completely different than, uh, where I was before. And, uh, I mean this, yeah, I'm, I'm stoked, man. I'm excited. (laughs) Yeah, that's awesome. So with mastermind talks, then you've, uh, how long has it been in existence, the business? This is only going to be a third event. So realistically, uh, our first event was May, 2013, so less than two years. Um, so we've we've gotten some great traction, some great success in a short period of time. Yeah, well, I mean, you're pumping out a lot of really great information in, in you know, just your interviews that you do. Um, I mean, with uh, world class uh, entrepreneurs is, you know, they're incredible. They help a lot of people. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm very I, I did the podcast for, for several reasons. Uh, and the, uh, I wrote a book for kind of the same reasons. One of them is that if I get hit by a truck tomorrow, I'm leaving nothing behind. The people in the, like the mastermind talks community, it's a hand selected group of people. And I mean, these, these are the people I want to support a hundred percent. But again, if I get hit by a truck and my daughter has nothing, like I'm not leaving anything behind. And actually this became, this is actually, uh, I don't know if you listened to, uh, there's an episode, episode 10 of the podcast where I uh, interviewed, uh, my friend Jordan Gernstein, who, actually just passed away of cancer. One okay. of the most amazing men I've ever met. His mindset, I highly suggest you listen to the podcast. Yeah, I haven't heard that his, one. His mindset around cancer, like he, he, his saying was that, uh, I will no longer have cancer when cancer doesn't serve me. He saw cancer as a gift because it, it, it for his business, it, it got him out of the business and started focusing on his family. Wow. He was stage three in melanoma cancer. Um, and, uh, he was, they gave him five years to live, and unfortunately, yeah, he just passed recently. Um, yeah, really right. One of the most positive people on the planet. But one thing, when he passed, he that was one of the most difficult passings. I've, I've had people like, you know, grandparents pass and all that. When I'm like, they're old. They, they were going to go within an hour. Yeah. Or they, a had a good, they had a good life, you know. What do you, what do you expect? This is one of the first time where I was like really impacted. Um, even though I didn't even know him. I wasn't even super close friends with him, but I felt like the world was missing out with him not because he, he had cancer and he was he went to like thailand for like the uh, the hurricane relief and stuff like that like just really really giving dude but the biggest thing was is that when he passed there was nothing out there that he produced and it was such a like there was no book there was no podcast interviews besides the one i did with him there was nothing and it was such a shame um because i mean the, a man like that his views on things could i mean could profoundly impact a lot of people so yeah, yeah. No, that's unfortunate, definitely. Well, that's – yeah, that's that's interesting. So, I mean, it, with our listeners, you know, with – you've done a lot of transformations in your health and your business. You know, mm-hmm. what, are some, what are some, like, tips that, you know, if you could give, you know, one or two really key tips, what would you suggest for them? 
Uh, easy. Uh, who you surround yourself with is who you become. There's a couple of great quotes like that. You're the average of five people you spend the most time with. Uh, show me your friends, I'll show you your future. This goes, this transcends all aspects of life, whether it be your health, whether it be your relationships, whether it be your business. Um, I've always unconsciously, now consciously, surrounded myself with people who are one or two steps ahead. Okay. And, and what that does um, is we all have a deep yearning to be connected or to be part of a tribe or a group. And this stems back to our old like primal days or whatever, because if you weren't part of a tribe 10,000 years ago, you would die. Either you'd, you know, you'd get eaten by another animal or you'd starve to death, mm -hmm. right? So the only reason we've been able to evolve as a species is simply because we've been able to band in numbers. So we have this strong desire to, to, to be a part of something. When you pursue people who are a step or two ahead of you, who have what you want, unconsciously what that does is it forces you to bridge that gap as quickly as possible um, so that you can feel like you belong to that group. So when I was trying to lose weight, I actually didn't realize it till a few months in. When I tried to lose weight the second time, I realized I was the most out of shape person in my peer group. Mm -hmm. Everybody else, I had one friend who was a Canadian kettlebell champion. I mean, the guy weighs 165 pounds and deadlifts like 550 pounds. Uh, okay. Everybody else was like in ridiculous shape. I was the most out of shape person. And that has a profound effect on how you choose your food, how you choose everything. Like when I was out with those guys, you better believe I was eating clean. I wasn't eating hamburgers, you know what yeah. I mean? So how, you, again, who you surround yourself with is who you become. Business contacts, the same thing. I mean, if you have a million dollar business, surround yourself with people with $50 million businesses. It will change everything, how you view the world, the decisions you make, all that kind of stuff. So that's probably one of the most profound things I've, I've discovered um, and has shaped my life in every aspect. Any area I want to improve, I surround myself with people. I surround myself with people who are triathletes. I am not going to enter any kind of triathlon yeah. anytime soon. But these guys are at the top of their craft and you better believe some of their knowledge kind of trickles down to me. So, Yeah, definitely. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so do you do you always surround yourself with people who are ahead of you, maybe some people behind you, you know, or is it just always people who are ahead of you? No, this is good. This is good because I came to this realization rather recently. Uh, so historically, I've always surrounded myself with people who are ahead of me. The downfall to that, uh, and I wasn't aware of it originally, was you're, you're left feeling like crap all the time because you're always comparing oh, yourself yeah. to people who are above you, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I dealt with self-worth issues, being growing up as a fat kid and all that kind of stuff and weight issues. Uh, I dealt with self-worth problems all my life. And you wouldn't believe, and some people may hear this self-worth and they'll be like, oh, not me. You wouldn't believe how much like low self-worth and low confidence affects entrepreneurs and how many, yeah, it's just, it's mind boggling. Wipe them out, right? Oh, it's just, it's, it, I, you, it's, I, it, I can't even get it. I, I've done retreats with entrepreneurs who are like legit, well-respected, successful entrepreneurs. You know, they're, I want to grow to a billion dollars and take over this industry, that kind of stuff. And you start digging into, you know, the why they do things. Why did they do the things they do? And you find out it's because they're trying to prove something to, you know, their father. Okay. Their father never said they were proud. That happened to me when I'm, you know, I had an issue where I'm, I came to the realization my father never said he was proud of me. And that was the main driver for a lot of my business success. It, it, it showed up well because financially I made a lot of money. But when I attained it, I still didn't get that that sense of pride from my father or whatever. And once you're, you become more self-aware, you start realizing it. I don't know how I got on this tangent. What was the question? <laughs> we were talking about, well, you know, before we I jump back, you know, pain is a powerful motivator. So I want to point that out. You know, that's, One of the most that's what, it, yeah. what it comes down to with that story. But I was asking if you actually only can uh, hang out with people who are ahead of you or behind you. Oh, yeah. You or... So ahead of you, you feel like crap. Yeah. Below you. A lot of people surround themselves with people who feel below because then they feel good about themselves, right? But they never grow. Yeah. So you need a balance. Of, it, it's called the law of 33%. I heard it from this guy named Ty Lopez. So I got to give credit where credit is due. Um, so the, the philosophy is that, uh, and I've kind of elaborated on it, the philosophy is that you spend 33% of your time with people who are below you. What that does unconsciously, it makes you feel better. More importantly, if you're helping people, um, you need a deeper level of understanding if you're going to teach something. Right, whether it be health, whether it be um, you know a business or whatever case may be, if some, you're t teaching an up and comer, you need to you know know the ins and outs, and having to kind of sit down and process that to to share to somebody else, it's just a, a great uh, I guess exercise in mastery. 
to some degree. Um, you want to surround yourself 33% of the time with people who are at your level because you have a deep desire to be connected to people who you know, face the same sh- struggles and stuff like that you do. Because if you hang, your, uh, hang around with people who are just above you, um, you don't feel understood. You don't feel like you, you know, you're, you're part of anything in particular. And then the other 33% is surrounding uh, yourself with people above. So it's, it's that kind of the mix. And it doesn't have to be a third or third or third exactly. But having that you know, variability uh, is big because I've done the extreme where it's all successful people. And again, you, you feel like you know, you're, you're, you feel like crap. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, you when you're looking at people who are way ahead of you, you always feel, uh, you know, what am I doing? How come I'm? How come I'm not them? Great example. Great example. My most depressing day of the year, up until last year, I guess, was my birthday. And the reason being is because, let's say I turned 26. Well, uh, Mark Zuckerberg has his birthday, same age as me, two weeks prior. So I always find out like, you know, it'll be on Yahoo or, you know, Mark Zuckerberg 29 or whatever the case may yeah. be. And I'd be like, this guy has a hundred billion dollar year business. I have a seven million dollar year business. What am I doing wrong with my life? You know what I mean? Like right. that is like the thought process. Oh, yeah. Because that's what I'm comparing myself to yeah. on like a regular basis. And I recently kind of got rid of that. But that was like a huge. And again, it works and, and, and motivates you and it mm-hmm. works great in some areas. But you get to this area where you realize, what the hell am I chasing, right? Yeah. Um, it's going to so, fatigue you is what it's going to do. Uh, yeah, yeah. And a lot of entrepreneurs, the thing is, I'm incredibly grateful. I became aware of this stuff when, you know, in my 20s. As opposed to some people, my, my father, for a great example, um, you know, his identity is tied to working. And he's 73 yeah. and still works 20-hour shifts. You know, like it's, and he's gonna die. And, but the thing is, he's been so ingrained to work that he can't stop. Like, yeah. he cannot stop. And if he stops, he'll die. Like, there's a statistic that most people die after, oh, yeah. you know, oh. retirement 9 a.m. on a Monday type thing, right? That's gonna be him. So he cannot stop. I don't wanna be that guy. Yeah. Um, and I'm very grateful I came to this, this kind of realization in my 20s and not, you know, when it's when I'm on my deathbed. So it's it's about finding value in other things other than your job or work. It's about finding value in your family, your relationships and and your happiness and, you know, so much more, right? Sure, 100%, absolutely. Okay. Well, Jason, it's been awesome having you on. Um, definitely, every time I talk to you, it's very enlightening. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> I know it's going to be enlightening for our listeners and uh, yeah, it's been a pleasure. I appreciate you having me on. Thanks, man. If you want more information to multiply your health and simplify your lifestyle, visit our website at excelpodcast.com. Until next time, have an outstanding day.